Hello members and welcome to our lecture series for 2020 and of course it's a very different lecture series in 2020 because of the pandemic and of course we're unable to meet face to face at our normal meeting place in Walkerville but in lieu of that we're using technology to try and continue on with our program unabated and to bring to you the speakers promised across the calendar year. And today we have got a special treat for you. While I'm nicely warm and snuggled up in my lounge room at Crathis in the Adelaide Hills where it's about nine degrees outside, our uh, guest speaker today, Dr. Geoffrey Gearhart, uh, is up on North Stradbroke Island where it's considerably warmer than it is here. So um, I'd like to now introduce to you Jeff and the uh, topic that he's going to talk to us about in this lecture. Dr. Jeffrey Gearhart is a marine biologist and a conservationist. He was born in Holland, raised in France, Indonesia, Latin America, and Jeffrey is, as a consequence of that, a French American and Australian citizen. And as I mentioned, lives on North Stradbroke Island in Queensland with his family. He has a PhD in oceanography from the Scripps Institution of, uh, Institution of Oceanography in the United States. And he travels extensively to study how large animals such as emperor penguins and leatherback sea turtles are affected by climate and ocean currents. He's a fluent speaker of some six languages. He's a diver, a pilot, a motorcyclist and so many other things. In this lecture we'll hear firsthand about Dr Gearhart's research work with sea turtles and his efforts to save them from human threats. It's a very warm Royal Geographical Society of South Australia Welcome to Dr. Jeffrey Gearhart. Hello, Jeff. Hello, Lee. Nice to meet you. Likewise, and thank you for joining us by your technology today. And I know that our members will really appreciate hearing what you have to say. So over okay. to you. Well, uh, I'll do my best. It's, uh, it's a very different setting to uh, what I'm used to uh, normally, you know, running for this purpose, but it's got some advantages also. Uh, among which me not having to travel to this very far and cold place of uh, South Australia. So anyway, <laughs> I um, so today I'd like to uh, tell you uh, and all the members of, uh, of your uh, geographic society about the work that I have done in uh, Indonesia as a young uh, conservationist because that's my main focus now is uh, marine conservation and uh, uh, and it's it's an interesting story because it brings together uh, this amazing um, biodiversity, but also uh, the uh, the human component, which is always the most challenging part of any conservation work. So, um, without further ado, I'd like to um, get into my presentation and show you some slides and some videos, and you'll get an idea what the challenges uh, are. Uh, challenges that conservationists around the world face on a day-to-day -day basis because um, interestingly these uh, the problems we face as conservationists are pretty much the same all over the world whether it's in Australia or in uh, Zimbabwe there is a common thread and that has to do with greed and all kinds of other uh, things so I'd like to go over to the share screen um, and so it says here, host disabled participant screen sharing. And so it means that I might not be able to, okay, here we are. We'll launch this. Okay, so the, uh, my work in Indonesia is focused uh, most of all in the eastern, uh, the eastern part of Indonesia, which is the, the least traveled part. And it's also dubbed the, uh, the Coral Triangle. I'll explain to you what, uh, what it entails and why it's called the Coral Triangle. If you look in the map, and I'm gonna uh, move my cursor here. If you move, look, look in this map on the upper right corner, you'll see a uh, you'll see a, a number of countries and there's indonesia there's philippines in the north indonesia uh, with west papua and papua new guinea and also the solomon islands and this geographical area 
forms more or less a triangle. Oh, and Timor Leste is also included. And it, and it is, it is uh, called the Coral Triangle because it concentrates by far the uh, um, largest numbers of uh, corals and fish in the world. So it is, uh, in terms of, of it is the, the, the most diverse uh, submarine rainforest, uh, so to speak, in the world. Uh, it, it is um, Indonesian itself. So uh, this area over here, I'll show you. This is called the heart of the coral triangle. It's smack in the middle of the coral triangle. And there is over 3,000 species of fish have been described. It's almost 40% of the total number of fish in the world on the planet. At over three quarters of all the reef building, all the hard corals of the world are also found in this uh, small geographical region. Now within the coral triangle, the central part, central part, which is um, um, represented by the island of New Guinea over here, is within the coral triangle is even richer. And so because of this uh, uh, biodiversity, over here you see the Bird's Head Peninsula, which is the center of the coral triangle, because of this marine biodiversity, it's been uh, considered, it's been um, declared a conservation hotspot. The conservation hotspots are basically priority uh, conservation areas. And the, uh, the theory is that if you can preserve those uh, extraordinarily rich areas in the world, and it can be um, terrestrial hotspots also, it's not only marine. If you can focus on, focus all your, your limited resources uh, um, onto um, the protection of those uh, hotspots, you may be able to weather the storm and hope that within 50 or 100 years when we get our act together and when we're uh, um, less uh, damaging to our environment, these conservation hotspots, which have been protected during that course, during that period, can see out and can replenish the surrounding areas that have been degraded by overfishing or, um, or other um, coral bleaching, etc. And so that's the that's the theory behind conservation hotspots, and it's obviously caused by the fact that our conservation um, conservationists are always bootstrapped. They're always um, we're always limited in terms of, of uh, funding. If we only had the uh, the the funding that uh, big mining corporations had for their for their for their um, activities, we'd be uh, really well off and we'd be able to do a lot of things. And unfortunately, there's just very little money uh, available for um, protecting nature. Hence the importance of hotspots. And so I'm going to show you a few uh, just a few uh, pretty pictures of uh, what you can see. When you go dive or snorkel in the triangle, uh, these are just uh, uh, typical underwater vista here of soft corals and hard corals and a myriad of, of different fish swimming around. Um, this is another nice picture. It um, coral triangle is also a very important area for large marine megafauna, and uh, this is one of the few spots, along with Stradbrook Island, actually, where you can. Uh, swim with manta rays and um, it's also the interesting thing about the uh, the uh, coral triangle is it is also um, a through flow area uh, of waters from the Pacific mixing with the Indian Ocean and because of all this uh, exchange of water there's very deep uh, um, trenches very uh, deep trenches between the islands to enable all this and these become um, migration corridors for large marine uh, mammals, such as whales and, and dolphins, and et cetera. So very, very rich uh, and important uh, region. Uh, here I'm showing you an example of one of the many fishes that have been discovered recently. This was, um, well, fairly recently. This was in 2005, uh, one of my uh, my, my boss, actually, Mark Erdman, discovered this new species of uh, walking shark, Nepolet shark. And uh, he showed me this picture and he said, Jeff, I think this is a new species. And sure enough, they, a month later, they, the paper came out and they described this uh, new Nepolet shark from Raja Ampat. And this is one of the over uh, 100 new fish species that, uh, that Mark described or has determined over the years in this area. 
this is, uh, I think, a very interesting picture also because uh, it was not taken in Raja Ampat or in West Papua, but very near, uh, very nearby in, Man in uh, North Sulawesi. And this is uh, Mark Ferdinand's wife, Arnaz, with a coelacanth. The coelacanths were thought to exist only off the Comoro uh, Islands and uh, South Africa, some locations of South Africa. It was discovered uh, in uh, 1938. It was thought extinct for over 50 million years because it only the most recent example of the coelacanth was in the fossil record. And all of a sudden, in 1938, a fisherman caught uh, coelacanth. And uh, so it was back in the day a major, major discovery. And until then, until recently, it was thought that these coelacanths only occurred off uh, this particular area of South Africa. And all the funding for coelacanth re research went to one group, uh, uh, researched to, uh, and protect the coelacanths of South Africa. And one day at the uh, local fish market in Manado, Mark and Arnaz saw a coelacanth lying in a fish stall. And so they realized that there were coelacanths over there. So this is another, I'm going on a tangent, this is another almost detective story about the story of the Indonesian uh, coelacanth. And I think you can find some details online. It's not the subject of this talk today, but I'm, I'm telling you about this because it just illustrates how, how interesting this area is and how many discoveries are still uh, to be made. And of course, the main topic of the, uh, of the uh, presentation, my presentation today, this is a very important area, my migratory corridor for leatherback sea turtles. And it also, incidentally, uh, is the uh, location of the last important um, nesting site for the Pacific leatherback. Leatherbacks are the largest uh, sea turtle species, the second largest marine reptile after the uh, saltwater crocodile. These are amazing animals that haven't evolved, basically haven't evolved in almost 100 million years. So I'll get back to that. Well, with every fairy tale story there's always a there's always a bad guy and in the case of uh, of um, the coral triangle and more specifically of Raja Ampat there is uh, there's some really nasty things going on too these are actually uh, pictures and vistas that you would see all over Southeast Asia and sadly uh, uh, they also occur in Raja Ampat and you look at the uh, upper left side of the screen, I'll go scroll over with my, my mouse here. You see uh, the effects of, um, of a bomb going off in the water. This is dynam blast fishing, dynamite fishing, which used to be very uh, in uh, Raja Ampat. Over here, you see a hammerhead shark that has had its fins chopped off, being tossed overboard. Shark finning was still is to a certain extent common in Raja Ampat. And on the uh, on this uh, slide here, on the upper right corner, you see the island of Kauai. And island of Kauai is uh, lies in the northwestern tip of Raja Ampat, and was the site of a uh, nickel mine. The problem with nickel mining is that uh, nickel occurs in the top layer of the uh, soil, so you need basically to remove the top layer of uh, of uh, the earth in order to access the nickel ore. It's called strip mining. And it's extremely damaging to the environment. And so this mine popped up out of nowhere um, without any, any uh, um, how do you say, permits whatsoever. And uh, so Conservation International, the uh, organization I was working for, did some research and found that uh, a Chinese company was behind this mine uh, and was operating uh, with permission from the local uh, tribal chief. And uh, there were, um, every month or so, there was one big ship or two ships would come. One ship would uh, go north and the other ship would travel south after picking up the raw ore um, from this island. And so Conservation International um, um, did some research on the, uh, the uh, reporter, investigative reporter, found that uh, the ships going north went to China and the ship going south went to a harbor, a port in um, the northern territory, I think. And uh, with a little more digging, they found that that port belonged to uh, a, an Australian mining um, magnet called uh, Clive Palmer. 
and so with uh, when that was known i think the uh, reporter reached out to uh, the uh, former organization and asked for some more information about uh, why they were engaged in mining in Baj Ampat, which was already known, this is back in the 2004, 2005, it was already known as one of the most uh, biodiverse places in, on Earth and was already pretty high profile. And so uh, the uh, mine very quickly shut down afterwards. And so it's not known whether it was due to pressure from shareholders, etc. But uh, this was fortunately uh, this was short-circuited and, and stopped. But you can see the damage that a mine does on the lower um, right picture in this uh, my, my screen. And you see these are village kids are standing in uh, the silted water um, because of all this runoff from the uh, from the mine. And so this obviously killed off the corals very quickly. So more specifically, I would want to focus on the uh, on the sea turtles the sea turtles in uh, in uh, Raja Ampat when I started getting involved in this uh, in this region very little was known about them we there was a report that in the, uh, the small island of uh, Biai and I'll go over there to show you the general area here with my uh, my mouse in this little tip of the northwestern tip of Raja Ampat there was supposedly a, a small area a small island that was a green turtle nesting site and we knew about this because we talked to local uh, fishermen and uh, fishermen said when we want to uh, eat some uh, green turtles we go over there to this little island we also knew about the uh, the uh, presence of leatherbacks foraging throughout the islands of Rajampa and also uh, of hawksbills nesting and that was about it i was uh, as a young uh, um, biologist in uh, 2005 I was asked to join the uh, Conservation International uh, team in Raja Ampat because I had experience working with sea turtles. And uh, so they asked me if I could uh, put the first satellite transmitters on turtles and green turtles in Raja Ampat because there was a need to know where these nesting individuals, these nesting females, would go after they had finished nesting. Because if you want to protect uh, efficiently protect a sea turtle, you can't only protect the nesting site, given that 99% of their lifetime is spent in foraging areas, which can be very far away from their nesting site. So if you want to have a, an efficient uh, um, protection uh, or conservation program, you need to address both uh, the foraging areas where turtles spend 99% of their lifetime and the nesting areas. So um, I was tasked to put these first satellite transmitters on turtles in uh, actually in Indonesia and so the first satellite tags in Indonesia and uh, and so I went over to uh, West Papua. it was my first trip I was very excited I would like to also this is something that I wanted to tell you before uh, when I talk about West Papua 99% of the people um, think I'm talking about PNG Papua New Guinea and it is not Papua New Guinea West Papua I think I have a West Papua here, you see in this picture here, is the Indonesian half of the Great Island of New Guinea. So the island, Great Island of New Guinea is divided into, uh, on the, uh, the um, western side is Indonesian, it's been annexed in 1969. It used to be called Irian Jaya, now it's called West Papua, and the eastern side is called Papua New Guinea. So it's a very different country, a very different place. So in uh, 2005, in October 2005, I went over to, uh, West Papua to put those satellite transmitters on. So we traveled on a small speedboat and uh, traveled for about 10 hours to reach the island of Piai where we had reports from fishermen that uh, there were sea turtles nesting there. So this was the first site I had of the island of Piai and it doesn't look like much and it isn't much. It's only 115 hectares and it's a yet a very, very uh, interesting and beautiful uh, beautiful little island and so we approach with our boat and the first thing we see was this three very large sea turtles lying on their on their backs on their carapaces on the sand and there was a, a camp with local um, uh, local islanders and there were poachers and uh, my blood started boiling right away when I uh, when I saw this 
and I thought, oh no, they've killed these turtles, and I was ready to jump on land and, and confront the uh, confront the locals and my friends on the my Papuan friends on the boat. No, you stay here. This is not a good idea. <laughs> you stay here. We'll talk to them. And uh, so they went off, and the turtles the turtles were moving. So I realized that they weren't dead. And so we negotiated with uh, with the poachers, and we uh, paid I think twenty dollars for each turtle to buy them from them. And these became the first Indonesia's first three satellite tracked um, turtles. So that was pretty exciting. And so um, I did some reconnaissance uh, throughout the uh, throughout the island and walked around and. It was basically a, a, a graveyard of, of turtles. You can see all these shells here, and there were literally hundreds just littering the uh, the beaches and uh, the the forest of uh, of this small island. And there were four other poacher camps, also just just spread o spread over the uh, spread along the uh, the length of the uh, of the beach. And so this was still a very um, uh, popular poaching ground. And I realized that there were these poachers were going to, uh, to uh, very quickly wipe out whatever was left there. And so I was, uh, it was a strange feeling for me because I went there as a scientist thinking, okay, we're going to get this, this amazing data. We're going to figure out where the nesters of uh, EI are going to travel to, are going to migrate uh, back to. And, and that morphed into, for me, into a, a rescue mission because I realized that if I didn't do something to protect this island, it would get the sea turtle population would effectively get wiped out before we even get the data. So um, I'm get some give you some more uh, pictures of, of, of uh, what we saw during that first that first trip. And here you can see on the upper right side, you can see a basket with uh, with hundreds of, uh, of eggs. And these eggs have been extracted, been taken out of the uh, out of the bodies in the turtles after they've been butchered by the uh, by the poachers. And you see on the on the right um, on the lower right side, you can see a um, it's a smoking rack that's filled with turtle meat and uh, and sausages with eggs inside. So this was. Really, it was a, a big operation, or obviously not a subsistence um, thing. And these were poachers that were actually uh, selling; they were making a living out of uh, of us. And uh, you know, speaking with them, we realized we're all from one single island group called Ayao, and I'll show you the next slide where that is. But basically, there uh, all the poachers were um, come from this one single spot, and you see that very much in Papua. You see that. Uh, certain islands have their each island has their specialty in terms of fishing or farming, and so the specialty of the Ayao Islanders is, is specifically is uh, sea turtle hunting. The other sad thing that we uh, that we also uh, discovered, and that was in later later trips to uh, to Biai, was uh, we would find these uh, turtles lying um, dead turtles lying on the on the sand of the uh, of the of the beach with their uh, their uh, plastron, which is the lower side of their, um, the lower part of their their body, of their uh, carapace, their shell, split open, so cut open, and uh, so you'd see the uh, the insides of the turtle, and the only thing missing uh, on these turtles was the livers, and so these turtles had been killed by uh, shark finners. Shark finners would stop by the island, knowing that there was a nesting site. They would wait during the night. They would wait for the turtles to come up. And then they would uh, they would uh, butcher these turtles only to extract the livers because the livers make really good bait for sharks. And so you get this very grim equation where you get uh, one large sea turtle, probably 80, 90, 100 year old individual, which is a very large old turtle here, uh, was being uh, sacrificed just to get the liver out. And that liver was used to catch one single shark of which only the fins were chopped off. <laughs> so, um, as a very uh, a very upsetting on one hand very upsetting thing to see and at the same time very motivating to uh, do something about it. So I knew that uh, uh, the uh, this nesting population was was going to go down the drain very quickly if uh, something wasn't done. And so um, you get an idea of the location of these uh, these um, of the Ayao, of the Ayao Islands, which is an island group. Where these uh, turtle poachers are from, 
and they travel basically they travel all over West Papua you know they travel all over West Papua two different uh, areas are also visited and locals here also say oh yeah the the, the poachers from Ayao come over here to get our turtles so the Ayao uh, islands are known all over uh, West Papua so the um, I put here, I put the uh, first satellite transmitters on hard shell turtles in Indonesia, and here you see the uh, one of the turtles, probably the, the first turtle I tagged, uh, leave the beach. And of these, of the five tags I put on PI, you'll see here on the map, one of the turtles did a very long migration. This is over 3,000 kilometers. It's not in a straight line. Turtles don't swim in straight lines. There's all kinds of little curls and stuff. And this turtle had traveled from PI where it nested all the way to its foraging area in uh, off the uh, of Kalimantan, which is the Indonesian uh, part of the island of Borneo. And uh, the other turtles, one traveled to the island of Aru and others more locally. So this was a very interesting map. It was the first uh, uh, glimpse into uh, migration, uh, post-nesting migration of Indonesian hard turtles. And this, incidentally, this map here, this satellite tracking map that I made, was an instrumental um, uh, tool for us to gain, um, to convince local communities to allow us to protect the turtles. And so the, the one of the really lucky lucky things for, of that trip was that uh, Conservation International, when they organized all this and uh, they, um, they got the boat and the, 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 the captain and all the, the, the people who join us on this trip. He also invited this local uh, gentleman called Ferdiel Balamu. And Ferdiel was my age, he's my age. And uh, he uh, was the uh, founder of a local, or he's the founder of a local nonprofit called YPP, which is the Indonesian acronym for the uh, Papua Sea Turtle Foundation. And, uh, and he was trying to get started uh, to protect sea turtles in Raja Ampat. And uh, this was a very lucky thing because he had everything it takes to be a successful conservationist. And he's uh, a very gutsy, um, a very good diplomat. Uh, his wife is married with one of the local, uh, with a, with, uh, with, he married a woman from one of the local tribes, which is also a very important connection. And so I had a feeling I had all the ingredients to start something successful. So. When I wrote my report to my uh, to uh, the people that uh, hired me, I of course went to all the details of the uh, of the tracking work that I did, but then I also made an appeal for help uh, to protect the turtles of PI, and I showed all these pictures in my report, etc. And so we get, we got funding. We started off with five thousand dollars, and uh, we started going to uh, the village that owns. The island of PI. There's no one living full time on PI, and the village that owns the tribe that owns PI is located at two hour, a two hour boat drive from the island. So we spend a considerable, considerable amount of time uh, in uh, this village to talk to the community members who were very uh, doubtful in the beginning and uh, didn't really trust what we were trying to do, especially because I was a white man. And, white men are not always uh, uh, trusted, outsiders in general, especially Indonesians. And, uh, and so it took, us, it took us a while to convince them to, uh, to, um, to allow us to set up a conservation program on PI. But what really helped was to show this uh, satellite tracking map where, where you see the, uh, the, the migration, the migratory routes of these turtles. And uh, interestingly, uh, uh, local um, villagers, local fishermen, they have a very good uh, spatial, uh, spatial awareness because they're always out in nature. They observe their surroundings very well, I think better than we do in our you know, urban lives. And so they're very aware of the shapes of their reefs and, uh, and the shape of the peninsulas, etc. So when I showed the map, the satellite tracking map, they recognized a lot of features of, of Raja Ampat, and so, and they were absolutely amazed that these turtles that they thought were just these, these animals that, you know, taste good and, and, you know, the little glimpse that they have is turtles that they see on the reefs 
and the turtles that they that nest on the on the on the island, but they had never thought that turtles would travel that far, and way farther than they had ever been with their speedboats. So the, it, this, the, the satellite tracking map just raised their uh, their uh, appreciation for for sea turtles, and it was instrumental in them saying, "Okay, you guys can do whatever you want." And so the important the the, the uh, the important, the key step that's required when you work in New Guinea, in both in Papua New Guinea as in West Papua, is that you need the local leaders, local clan leaders, to impose a, a taboo. And in Indonesian, it's called in, uh, in Papua, it's called a sasi. And it's basically a ban, it's a traditional ban or taboo on the taker of a specific resource. Sasis can happen in the forest, uh, and can happen on the uh, Fish, for instance, you know, specific areas set aside, you're not allowed to fish a certain species of fish, but it can also be a taboo on a whole island. And so we were able to get a sasi, a, um, a ban on the uh, on the take of the turtles on PI, but also on just um, uh, just using any resource on the island. And so that set the stage for us with the next national to build a patrol post on the, on the island of PI. And so we used a local, a few local uh, uh, large trees that had fallen from uh, from the island, ironwood uh, trees, very very tough wood, and we built this patrol post. And uh, we then uh, hired a group of people from the from the village. You can see that in the upper right corner. And we hired these young, these young folks who just fishermen, and some of them turtle poachers. And we hired them to patrol the beaches of the island and start gathering data on the nesting. Because if you want to uh, set up a conservation program, the very first thing you need to do is to gather information on uh, on the situation when you start it. It's called a baseline, baseline data. So you need to know how many turtles nest there per year at the very beginning of your program. Because that's your metric upon which your your next results will be measured uh, measured against. And so uh, we trained. So that was my my task as an outside um, consultant. I was uh, coaching the uh, Papua nonprofit, and I was coaching them to teach uh, these local kids to become turtle patrollers. And it was a very exciting period where I could see the. The minds and the uh, and the uh, the opinions of these of these young fishermen just morph from going to you know a mindset of okay turtles are just only good to eat to okay wow these animals are amazing and, and they represent a real you know a real asset for us because divers will come here uh, foreigners will come here and they'll you know they'll look at our turtles and etc. So it was a very interesting interesting period. And here in the center you see one of the staff members of. Uh, of the YPP, the Papua Sea Turtle Foundation, with one of his um, creations. It's a, it's a wooden replica uh, of an M16 assault rifle, American assault rifle. Now I'll tell you more about this later, but it has a function. Another interesting uh, uh, spin off of this project is, uh, was that uh, Conservation International, uh, along with the World Wildlife Fund and uh, the Nature Conservancy, funded the uh, the uh, refurbishment of an old um, cargo ship into a floating classroom. And it's called the Calabia. And Calabia was crisscrossing Raja Ampat and teaching local communities, kids from uh, local villages, about the importance of preserving marine resources. And so that was a very successful and I think a very nice um, uh, um, activity from uh, Conservation International. So we were able, so we we were um, able to uh, provide a hundred percent protection of the island from poachers, but also from uh, blast fishers, from shark finners. No one was able, or no one was allowed to uh, to approach the island. The problem is that um, the when you get a ban on a on a resource like this, the ban is one thing, the enforcement is the other. Indonesia is a country. Indonesia is a country where um, civilians cannot own guns. Only the military and the police can do that. And when you're confronting uh, um, very tough um, 
people like uh, shark finners and uh, and uh, blast fishers and I say tough because they're engaging in an illegal activity so it's already it's it's a certain breed of people that uh, that do this and they tend to be uh, they tend to be pretty uh, pretty brutal uh, so so the problem is that you you have the law on your side you have the national law that says you're not allowed to uh, you're not allowed to take turtles you're not allowed to use uh, dynamite fishing uh, etc uh, you got your uh, local backing. You've got your um, your local band that uh, helps you also. But if you don't have actual uh, way to enforce, things are just going to continue as, as as before. And so we had this patrol post on the island, but we didn't have any any real real muscle. And so here comes in these. Uh, these dummy weapons that were built by the uh, by the patrols and by these villagers with driftwood and pieces of plastic that came floating in the ocean, so they were able to uh, to build replicas of M16s and AK47s and whatnot and paint them black. And so, uh, anytime they would hear the sound of an approaching uh, blast fishing boat, and you can hear it by the, this, this low pitched thudding thudding sound of the engines. And every time you would hear this, uh, this, these boats approaching from distance, they would put up, put on these military fatigues, and prepare their, their dummy weapons. And then, as the boat was approaching, they would start marching on the beach with their with their weapons. And that always had a very, very quick effect. <laughs> and they would never, if they if they had time to to, uh, to lower their anchor, they would lift it right away and and, and leave. So, with the help of a little bit of uh, of creative um, you know, creative thinking. Uh, we, or YPP, with my little bit of my help, a, a were able to uh, provide 100% protection to not only the turtles but also the whole environment, so the reefs around the island, etc. And uh, it was also we also uh, we're also able to empower the locals, teach them new skills, and uh, so it was a, that the uh, results were very quick and uh, and very encouraging and. And over the ten years, so the last complete uh, data set we have is from two thousand was two thousand sixteen. So over a, a ten year period from two thousand five that we started collecting data on nesting, uh, we had eight hundred nests late in the season in in the year on the island, and that went up to four thousand nests, so five fold increase in ten years in the number of nests. And that's an extraordinary uh, um, result. So you have a base program. Up our sea turtle program has been expanding uh, since ever since. They are now active in different areas of Raja Ampat. Uh, they don't focus only on green sea turtles, but also on uh, leatherbacks and hawksbills. So that was very um, that was very encouraging. And also one of the one of the key things was that in 2006, so the, the year after we started, the uh, a large marine protected area was declared was gazetted by the Indonesian government, and it that area encompasses uh, the small island of Piai that I'm talking about, but also the uh, island of Wayag, and I'll show you some pictures of Wayag later. So that's the uh, that was the, uh, the quick results that we got, and the the, the program has been running uninterruptedly since ever since, and uh, they've had their ups and downs, but they're still there, and uh, they're still doing very very good work. Of course, there's there's a lot of challenges, and uh, and we still have to deal with um, peri periodic takeovers of villagers that are angry because they can't eat any more turtles, and so they go over to the island and they kill a few, two or three turtles, and then we're able to, to stop them and get back in the game, and and so that's the ever the um, the the, the, um, the never ending and never ending struggle that we have uh, on the local level. There's also cultural aspects we have to deal with, and they have to do with, um, for instance, and that's illustrated by this this picture here, that there is uh, all kinds of, of beliefs, and, and in a place like Baku, and one of them is that the uh, these goanas that you see here, and they're very numerous on the island of Piai, these goanas are the reincarnated souls of warriors that died in tribal warfare and so these goanas really hammer the, um, the uh, eggs uh, 
and uh, the nests of the turtles. And, uh, and so if they're really a problem, and we are not able to do anything about them. I was removing them. Uh, it's very frustrating to see all these nests dug up by the, uh, by the guanas. And just, we just can't do anything about it because the guanas might be just this great grandmother of the, of the chief of the village. So we have to leave them alone. And it's also better like that because these Goan is also uh, endemic to uh, this area of, uh, of the world. So there's no real case to uh, remove them. So uh, but the, the main, the main uh, difficulty um, still is besides, you know, these episodic struggles, local struggles, is uh, the, uh, the need for long-term funding of these projects. And so they've been, um, the Yepeke has been relying on a steady stream of funding from Conservation International. But uh, as always, these international organizations, they uh, never stay forever. And the, the whole idea is that you build capacity, build local capacity, and then you hand over the project to uh, local organizations. And, uh, and so that's what happened uh, a few years ago. Conservation International pulled out of West Papua, stopped their Birds Head Seascape program, of which this, was, uh, this project was part, and uh, handed it over to the Indonesian government. And there was, um, there was some funding that was, uh, that was guaranteed through a, a large uh, endowment. And uh, that has been funding the program on PI to a certain extent, but they had to scale down their, uh, unfortunately had to scale down their efforts due to limited funding. And so I realized I moved out of Indonesia. Um, I went to live in the US and then now I'm in Australia. So I'm not on the ground as I was before. And so I was, I've been looking at how I could, um, I could, I could still contribute to, uh, to their, um, to their work. And that has, Come in the form of uh, fundraising. And so I set up a conservation fund to support YPP, Papua Sea Turtle Foundation. And uh, uh, I also wanted this to be an independent. I didn't want to have my own fingers in the, uh, in the effort. I want to oversee, have an overseeing um, role. And so I found a mechanism through a, um, the, a, a nonprofit that's based in Brisbane called the Global Development Group. And what they do is they uh, provide a platform, a funding platform to a large number of small organizations over the, throughout the world. And they're not only, they're mostly focused on social work. And what they do is they enable um, tax-free donations, tax-deductible donations by Australians and also Americans, a number of other countries to be routed through their uh, panel. They take a small, um, administration fee i think it's uh five percent or a seven and a half percent administration fee uh to administer the funds and uh to audit also to audit these different organizations to make sure that the money has been spent well and then the remainder 92 and a half percent goes straight into the hands of these uh of these nonprofits. and for me it was a very um i thought it was a very nice way of um of getting getting um uh, with YPP funded. So I thought this was a very nice mechanism to ensure that the bulk of the money would go to uh, those who really uh, make a difference on the ground. Uh, very often when you give, when you donate money to a large uh, international nonprofit, uh, a substantial amount of that goes into administration fees and, and, uh, and very little trickles down to actually to the ground, to the field where, uh, where things are, you know, Things need to be done. So that's one of the ways that I uh, that I um, support my friends from uh, YPP. And um, the other way is that I um, try also to um, bring friends or people who are really interested in conservation in this area of the world. Try to bring them with me uh, to visit these areas and. Once you've been there and you've you've seen the challenges, you've seen how beautiful the area is, and you've seen the challenges that these conservationists uh, face. Uh, it is a very interesting. This 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 um, this fund is a very interesting way 
appealing way for them to uh, to have this connection to be able to directly help uh, the people that they actually met in uh, in Indonesia. So you can find more information about this uh, global development group uh, fund that I set up to support uh, sea turtle conservation in West Papua uh, by googling Kalawai Adventure or just uh, uh, googling my name and you'll land on my website and all the information is there. The other part of my presentation is um, that I was over the over the years that I've been uh, telling about this uh, conservation story people that have come up to me and asked me say can you take me there and so uh, a few years ago I said hey why not you know, so I always go alone there and, and I don't know I, have a, I don't have much of a record of all the things that go on I don't take many pictures and, and I thought okay this is a nice opportunity to share um, to share my knowledge and also these these incredible sites uh, with people who are passionate about nature and so um, I set up a trip to West Papua and uh, I'm going to tell you I'm going to you trips that I do now uh, once or twice a year I organize an expedition and they're ship based and we depart from the uh, from the, uh, the city of Sorong in West Papua, and as you can see, it's a long, uh, it's a long route that takes us to very to to, to different spots that are very very different in, in, in terms of their their um, features, uh, the types of corals, the, uh, the morphology of the, uh, the landscape, etc. And so uh, this is the overall route that we take. So it goes all the way from uh, Raja Ampat over here in the northwestern side, and it goes all the way down to Chenawasi Bay. So on the uh, the first leg of the trip, the first uh, first week more or less. So we are crisscrossing the uh, northwestern side, the uh, northwestern um, quadrant of uh, Raja Ampat, and we use as our base of operations our platform. Uh, the Putiraja, and Putiraja is a beautiful, um, it's a Pinisi schooner, it's a traditional Indonesian cargo ship that has been transformed into a, a real floating hotel. It's got all the amenities, and uh, it's got um, all the equipment for, for diving, nitrox diving, etc. It's also very comfortable. Some images of the, uh, the cabins, air conditioned, with toilets, individual toilets, everything. And there's, uh, there's a, a seating area outside on the deck where everybody gets together and we talk about all the amazing things we've seen during the day and cooking is also very good. And uh, the, uh, the village visits that we do, so we uh, we try to because most of the most of the trips that uh, people do to Raja Ampat are very much focused on diving. Every uh, West Papua is so much more than just than just reefs and fish. I mean, reefs and fish are a very very astounding part of it. But there is amazing forests, and there's birds of paradise, and there's uh, all these nesting turtles, and the human component. The, 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 these traditional cultures are extremely extremely interesting, also. And so um, I am able because I've worked there now for almost 20 years, and I've uh, establish very strong uh, bonds with uh, locals and uh, in different areas. I'm able to now uh, bring my friends there, and it, and it creates really a very it's a very interesting, very different dynamic when you know an area very well, you speak the language, and you know personally know the people. From uh, if you just do a tourist trip where you just do uh, uh, sightseeing and, and a few guides, so I think in that sense. People, people are very happy to uh, to go on these trips. This is uh, a young boy that's uh, captured midair jumping from the pier. Here you can see another of Raja Ampat's feature that if you you know Google right now, these these types of pictures of, of karst formations. And the amazing thing always when I see these uh, these karst rocks jutting out of the ocean is the is the thought that all this limestone, everything was built by tiny marine organisms over millions and millions of years and then uplifted to form these uh, 
these exposed rocks, just the, the thought that these massive structures were just built by, by living beings. Weather can turn on a dime in Raja Ampat, so you can have very good weather, uh, and 10 minutes later, all of a sudden, a blue sky 10 minutes later, just clouds roll in and you get this type of, of, uh, of sites. So it's very exciting. And, and, and you realize why these forests were so lush. And this is, these are, this is uh, a site of the island of Waigio. Uh, basically, this is uh, very close to the area where Alfred Russell Wallace landed in 1815. And so, uh, so that, that uh, feeling, you have that also when you travel through this area that you're, you're, you're following the footsteps of, of Alfred Russell Wallace and, and, you, uh, and you also, you, you really appreciate the hardships that he went through because you're just floating around in a very comfortable ship, whereas he was doing everything on sailboats and, and there was no malaria medicine back in the day. And he spent, I think, two years of that trip, just two years in a tent, just fending off these, these fevers that he had from all these diseases that he had to, uh, to um, uh, weather. And so the next stop is uh, the island of Pi, where we see uh, green sea turtles nest. Uh, it's always, sometimes we see up to 15 turtles nest in one day. So for me, it's, the, it's one of the highlights of the trip is to go back to this island that means so much to me. And uh, the reefs of BI are also uh, amazing. And, they've, and over the, the 20 years, no, 15 years that I'm going there, I have seen, I've seen it uh, transform from a reef that had substantial damage from blast fissures, broken corals, to something that's uh, recovered, greatly recovered. There's still a few scars visible. But uh, the reefs have recovered greatly, and, and uh, sharks have returned to the area, so you can really see the uh, see a transformation. And it's a shame that at the time I was so focused on turtles, and I wasn't, I didn't have the uh, the means or the yeah, I didn't have the means to to establish baselines in terms of coral coverage because I could have proven how efficient um, this program, this conservation turtle for conservation program, has been also on protecting the reefs around the island of Pi. So uh, from PI on, we move to uh, the next destination. The next destination is the crown jewel of Raja Ampat, and it's called Wayag. And uh, this is a uh, very, it's, it is perhaps the most famous site uh, in Raja Ampat. And uh, we go there, it's about a two hour um, steam or sail from PI to get there and when we arrive there we are always I'm always stunned by the by the scenery. So the next image is a video that um, I made and I'll give you a, an oversight of, of what you can see there. The uh, next stage next stage of the trip we move to uh, an area called the Bird's Head Peninsula. This is a very exciting spot for me because this is where I did uh, from 2000 9 to 2015, I did my uh, a great deal of my PhD uh, research work in this area. The other, the remaining work that I did was in Antarctica, and uh, so I spent on the birds. I spent about a year camping in different divided in, in different trips. Uh, I spent almost a year camping on the on the beaches there, and it's uh, compared to uh, Raja Ampat, is very very much more difficult and wilder place. Uh, here you can see the difference between the karst landscapes, the uh, pristine clear waters of, of Raja Ampat, and here you can move to uh, a very long, large, uh, very long coastline. Um, these are granitic um, mountains, granite mountains, very deep, uh, dense rainforests. There's large rivers outflowing there, so you don't have coral reefs. But uh, it is an extraordinarily uh, interesting area for um, for the terrestrial part. So it is home to several species of birds of paradise. This is called the lesser bird of paradise that we always see over there when we visit the Bird's Head Peninsula. Uh, this is the red bird of paradise. This is a picture that was taken uh, in Raja Ampat, which is this species is is endemic to uh, to Raja Ampat. 
extraordinary bird. And uh, the reason, the, the main reason why we stop at the Birds Head Peninsula is because it is the last important nesting site for the Pacific Leatherback. And so here we see the first group that uh, I took to, uh, to the area, 12 people from different places in Australia. And we walked from the uh, landing spot to uh, the nesting beach. And here you see one of the, one of the, uh, the travelers lying across a track of a leatherback. And it gives you an idea of how large these tracks were. And this is not even a very large individual that made this track. And it's, it's as, as wide as this, uh, this friend of mine's uh, who's, uh, who's lying on the beach. So when you see a leatherback tr uh, track coming out of the ocean, it looks as if someone has driven a tractor out of the water. And so here's a leatherback. Uh, this is a leatherback that has just finished nesting, and we exceptionally uh, decided to fix, make some flash, flash photography. Usually we wouldn't do that on uh, sea turtles nesting because it startles them, but we decided to do it because we had professional photographers with us, and uh, the pictures were then shared with conservation nonprofits who would be able to use it for, uh, for their uh, promotion of their conservation program. And so um, this turtle made it back to the water afterwards, so it didn't have any big consequences. But it's uh, this is why there's not many uh, pictures of leatherbacks nesting at night because of this issue of flash photography. And so here's uh, one of the uh, conservationists. Uh, just gives you an idea of the scale. This is uh, probably a 450 to 500 kilo individual. They can weigh up to uh, 7 to 800 kilos. And they, uh, there was about four to 500 females uh, remaining, more or less, uh, in, on uh, the bird's head. And the uh, beaches of uh, Jamors Bamedi, which is the name of this site, is one of the, um, that has the, uh, one of the places that has the highest density of nesting. And if you pick any, uh, you know, if you pick two days, let's say if you stay two days in this area, you're pretty much guaranteed that during the nesting season, you will see uh, a leatherback. And that's one of the, one of the reasons we go there. And there's very, there's no, or there's very few other spots in the world where you, where you have that, that, uh, that guarantee of, of seeing these, uh, these animals. So it's always a, a very special sight to see leatherbacks come out of the water. Another sight of uh, the same turtle going back in the water. And from there on, we get to the last, uh, last part of the uh, the journey, and that journey is down the uh, Chenawasi Bay. It's a large bay, of which half is has the status of a uh, national park. So it's Indonesia's largest marine protected area, and it's of course uh, has. It doesn't mean that there is no. Um, uh, it is a little bit of a legal framework, and there is some level of patrolling in the uh, in the bay, and um, and it is it is a very interesting place because uh, in terms of marine biodiversity, it's very very different. This, the species of fish that you find in Genoa Bay are very different from the ones you see in Raja Ampat, and there's a geological reason for that. But it's a little bit long to uh, get into that during this presentation. So, but the reason why we uh, we go down to Nawasi Bay is because we're looking for these boats. And these boats are called bagans. And bagans are lift nets. They consist in a central a central boat, a hull, and a bamboo frame around it. And there's all these cables that keep that bamboo frame uh, upright. And there's a net that is cast underneath from that bamboo frame underneath the boat during the night. So the boat has uh, a system of, uh, of lights that they turn on during the night and those lights attract the fish to the bagan, to the fishing platform. And the lights that are on the, the periphery of the frame are then turned off and only the lights that remain in the central part of the boat that shine downward are kept on. And so that causes fish to, to concentrate around the hull of the ship. And when that happens, when all the fish concentrated at the very center of the, of the structure, the lift net is then, all of a sudden is then lifted and traps all the fish around it. And why are we interested in going to see these bagans? 
the reason why is that uh, we have whale sharks. Whale sharks have uh, learned that they can have an easy uh, morsel if they wait for the gas nets to go up. So I'm going to show you a, uh, a video here of um, of what goes what's going on around these bagans. So um, you can get an idea of how close you can get to these uh, to these whale sharks. And there's interestingly there's there's guidelines uh, there's guidelines of how close you can get to whale sharks. In general, you can't get closer than two or three meters. And we do our best, and I tell everybody to not get any closer to that. But the problem is that the whale sharks will get will get to you. It's one of the few places where uh, you can interact that closely to whale sharks. And, uh, we always try not to touch them, but very often they'll just they'll just approach you because you're in the in the same line of uh, where the baits where the bait is cast. And so we uh, what we do is we tell the we find a bagan that has whale sharks swimming around them, and we ask them if they can keep a little bit of their bait uh, for the next day and to toss it in the water on regular intervals in order to keep the whale sharks interested. And so um, the uh, the um, fishermen are very happy to do that because they get something in exchange. We pay them in exchange, and this all sustains the small tourism industry. So it's a very uh, I think it's a very good example of a of a, a mutualistic relationship between humans and and, and animals, and and uh, and also how you can really um, you can really get a sustainable. A sustainable uh, source of income for uh, for these communities. And the interesting thing also is about the, is that these uh, these whale sharks are all uh, juvenile males. Uh, there's only only very few individuals have been uh, very few females have seen have been seen there. So they're all for some reason no one understands this. But it's it's juvenile males that go there, and uh, they. The satellite tracking of these uh, of these uh, whale sharks has shown that after a certain stage, after a few years, they'll just leave the area and they won't return. They uh, on a, on shorter time scales, satellite tracked individuals make uh, large uh, migrations. They can travel thousands of kilometers, stay away for a few months, and then return to the bay. And so, Chernowesi Bay is a developmental area for these whale sharks. Very obviously, this interaction with humans doesn't uh, harm them because they just, at a certain stage, they just uh, move on and they decide they don't want to be fed uh, fish anymore and they go on to feed on their natural uh, uh, prey, which is way smaller, plankton. And so, uh, there's a lot still needs to be learned on the, on the, on these uh, on these whale sharks. And I think over, uh, I think about 100 individuals, 100 sharks have been described through. Uh, uh, photo identification, and uh, there's a there's an ongoing uh, ongoing research uh, on these whale sharks in the in the in this area in Chanawasi Bay. So that is the uh, the end of the uh, end of the expedition. After that, we make our way back to uh, the city of Manukwadi, which is on the other side of the Birdshead Peninsula, and there from there on, we spend our last night on the ship, and then we get on the plane back to Jakarta. So. That is the oh here's a here's a uh, image which added some data that I found recent data on the uh, on the Chernawasi Bay uh, whale sharks and you see that uh, what I was telling you the 97 percent of the uh, of the sharks are males and they are juveniles and you know that by the size three to nine meters which is already very very large but it's nothing uh, compared to the uh, to the adults the adults measure up to 15 meters so. These are still small, small whale sharks, and uh, 17 sharks have been satellite tagged, and you can see here uh, on the on these two maps, you can see these dots are different uh, locations of satellite tag. So each color represents a different tag, and you see how the the uh, the sharks spread out throughout the uh, throughout the Pacific, but return to the bay after a few months. They dive very deep, also, so these tags allow to uh, to measure the uh, they record the depth, diving depth, so they they can uh, dive down to 2,000 meters. And, um, and yeah, I think the record the record uh, 
of migration was 4,000 meters, 4,000 kilometers. So that's the story of the whale sharks of uh, Chenoweth Bay. So if you're interested in joining uh, one of the expeditions, there is if COVID-19 situation allows uh, next year, there'll be uh, three trips. There's three trips planned uh, in June, uh, August, and September. Oh, June and August. And uh, so I don't know if there's so much uncertainty right now going on with uh, with the coronavirus, but uh, these dates still stand. So if you're interested in joining me, uh, feel free to contact me and uh, or I've got a Facebook page and you can just also just Google Chloe Adventure. And, uh, but you can just, maybe the easiest thing is just contact me and I'll give you all the information you need. So thanks a lot for um, your attention. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Jeffrey, thank you so much. It's been an absolutely fascinating presentation. I cannot tell you how much I have learned in a very short period of time. And if we were doing this in our normal lecture setting here in Adelaide, I can assure you our membership would be just brimming with questions that they would love to ask you about the things that you have told us. So if you don't mind, I, I, I might ask a few because certainly sure, sure, I, sure. I, have, I have many things I'd like to, to find out a little bit more about. But the, the work is marvellous, absolutely marvellous. And it sounds as though you have done just an enormous amount to ensure the conservation of these turtle species. Yeah. How confident are you that that will be ongoing? Well, it, I mean, you're never confident. Anything can happen, you know, in these places. Uh, they're, they're not very stable politically. And uh, uh, so you have to hope. And if you're not an optimist in this business, you have nothing to do. Uh, so I'm an optimist by nature. And, and I, uh, I, also tr I also trust that uh, the, 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 the people in charge, so this, this uh, Ferdiel, my, my, uh, my friend Ferdiel that I showed a picture of, He's still managing things, and he's still. I I talk to him on a regular basis, and he's still as passionate as he used to be. But I think as long as he's at the helm, uh, I'm, it's pretty safe to say that uh, things are going to go well. Um, I have also faith that the uh, increasing the the Rajampa is becoming really a, a top destination for for divers and eco tourists. And so that also offers a lot of extra guarantees for, in terms of preserving this area. It's it's uh, they can see this with Stradbroke Island. Uh, you know we have a lot of tourists. We're very happy during COVID nineteen because we're, there were no tourists around, and yet they are very important to sustain the local economy here. And, mm. and it's either that or we get back to sand mining. And so it's the same thing in in uh, in West Papua. You it's Sometimes you just see too many of these liveaboard boats during the, the, the high season, high diving season. And at the same time, you know that it's better to have lots of German divers or whatever in the in the water than um, than um, than having these mines and and, uh, and, and uh, I said like these logging companies. And there's so many uh, so many destructive practices that are, and that will be even even the pop ones engage in these activities because of the simple thing that you need to feed your family and mm -hmm. uh and so uh, and so i think i think that the combination of having good people on the ground good conservationists and having uh well-managed ecotourism is going to go a long way into you know ensuring that this area at least Raja Ampak, will be education is power they say and it, it would seem from what you what you've told us that you really have changed the way uh, the locals have uh, have been thinking about turtles and about their environment, and yeah. and, and are now seeing it through a completely different yeah. prism. Yeah. Well, hopefully, that will be the lasting legacy, won't it? So exactly. that they they understand and appreciate yeah. that, and they can capitalise on yeah. it. Yeah, they've understood. They've understood that uh, that turtles are more than just uh, just just food. They just couldn't understand. The very beginning, uh, I had a, a funny anecdote because at the very beginning, we had to do all these meetings with the villagers to ask for permission to start our conservation program. And one very important component when you when you when you try to get these baselines, try to know how many turtles nest in an area, you need to be able to distinguish one turtle from the other. 
in order to do that, you need to put some kind of marker on the turtle. And we use these tags to put on the flipper. It's right here. I put a metal tag with a number on it. And so I was trying to explain this to the villagers that we want to put these tags on the turtle. They said, no way, you're not going to put these tags on because you've got a magnet where you live in Bali because that was my base for Bali. So you've got a you've got a magnet in Bali to attract the turtles because they've got these metal tags on and then you eat them up. And I was trying to convince them that it was there was just no way forward. They just wouldn't trust me. And so then they gave me some betel nut too because everybody was too beaten. I'm sitting around this circle with all these old village elders and they give me some betel nut to chew. And I've never chewed betel nut before and I put it in my mouth. I just follow the, the corner of my eye, see how my friend is doing it. So I'm just I'm just uh, aping it. <laughs> and so I put the betel nut uh, stuff in my mouth and started chewing and it starts salivating a lot. And I don't know what to do with the saliva, so I swallow it. I mean, you should never swallow betel nut saliva. Mm. Spit it out, but I swallowed it. And when I swallowed it, within seconds, I start getting dizzy and I fall from my chair. And when I fell from my chair, I lost my balance, I fell from my chair, all of a sudden, all these old men, these villagers, started laughing, just laughing very loudly and just making fun of me. And within five minutes, five minutes afterwards, we got permission to put these flipper tags on the turtle. And all it took was to make a fool of myself and show that I was not as as spirited and so um so yeah that's an anecdote of, uh, you know how, how uh how you can you know turn things on the dime sometimes without wanting it without you know planning it <laughs> that's a great story so do you do you feel that ecotourism will be uh, a whole new industry now for uh, people in, in these areas and and provide them with a, a viable alternative to actually um, hunting or poaching or killing these sorts of things or exploiting the environment uh, in the way that they have previously with dynamite fishing. Oh well, yeah, it already is. It already is. They have uh, a lot of these villages now uh, rely, a big deal of their income relies on, depends on uh, ecotourism. There is uh, uh, local uh, dive resorts that have opened all over Raja Ampat. There used to be just one in Raja Ampat, and now there's, there's a dozen or more uh, dive resorts that uh, are operating from different from, uh, from different islands. They employ locals to staff these uh, these dive resorts. There's one that's very famous. It's the Niso Eco Resort that's doing extraordinary uh, work in terms of uh, preserving, protecting the uh, the south uh, southeastern but from, from shark finners, those are very good. Uh, that's a very good group. And um, yes, in general, um, you know, they do. I think I think uh, ecotourism is a very very good uh, uh, avenue for for locals. Yeah. And I, and I must say, I was staggered to see the size of those little back turtles too. I, I had no idea they were such large animals. Yeah, they're very large and they're on the bucket list of many people that like sea turtles because they only occur in a few places. So most people are very aware, very, very uh, uh, familiar with green sea turtles, oxtail, and moggers. There's lots of moggers here in Australia. And so on my first trip, I had uh, yeah. four groups of uh, uh, people from the local uh, sea turtle conservation group. And, and most of them just signed up because they wanted to see a leatherback. And, when we arrived at on the Birdsack Peninsula and they saw the leatherback, they said to me, you know what, we can go home now. I said, no, no, we haven't seen the whale sharks yet. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, <laughs> the leatherbacks are a real, uh, they're a real, um, they're a real sight. They're, real, they're like dinosaurs. So, oh, ma absolutely marvelous. Yeah. And then just finally, I'm, I'm sure that many of our members would be interested to support yeah. such wonderful work yeah. and that has such tangible and, and, and good, strong uh, conservation outcomes. How can, how can people do that, Jeff? Well, they can go to the uh, Global Development Group uh, website or to go to my website, which is, um, I have here, or I showed you on the, um, on the slide. Maybe you can put a link up on your, um, on your website. If you go to my website, there's a, there's a section uh, where you can, you can click on where you can donate uh, to this uh, total conservation program via the Global Development Group. And I don't know if I made it clear, but for me, the, the whole issue of, of running things through a Global Development Group was twofold. Was one, 
it would allow people to do a tax-free donation, and secondly, it would just separate me from separate me from the from the from the money and everything. So I just have no. Uh, I I there's there's people cannot uh, even think of me, you know, taking <laughs> part in it. And I'm just uh, I'm just remotely. I try to and even even. Uh, I can't control how the money is used. I know it goes to the EPP, and I discuss with my friend Fragel and I uh, and the here and stuff. But I'm not allowed. I'm not even allowed to say, "Okay, your money is going towards, for instance, uh, purchasing a new outboard engine for the speedboat." You know, because that is a very um, that's a real incentive for a lot of people to know exactly where their money goes to. Okay, my money went towards buying an outboard engine, and I can't even do that as a as a, uh, I can, I'm just an external, um, uh, how do you say, the advisor, and that's it. Yes. So, yeah. Yes, on behalf of the Royal Geographical Society of South Australia, thank yeah. you so much for your presentation. It, it is a shame under the circumstances that we couldn't host you yeah. in South Australia and get to meet you face to face and take you out to dinner after yeah. uh, having such a wonderful presentation. But. We, we, we've done the best that we can with the technology that we have under the yep. circumstances and it has been a fascinating yep. presentation. So from us all, Dr. Jeffrey Gearhart, yep. thank you so much. Okay, no problem. And I'll be happy to come in person if there's ever an opportunity and have that, that dinner with you guys. Because now, you know, it's not the same. I'll go or have dinner tonight and think of you. But it's, it's not the same. It's going to have a <laughs> all, all the very best. Okay, see you later. So there you go, members. There is our June lecture for 2021 via the technology of Zoom. I hope you've enjoyed it. And I hope that very, very soon, once restrictions continue to ease, that we can uh, return to normal and get back to having our lectures face to face in Walkerville. In the meantime, uh, thanks so much for using this technology. And again, to Dr. Jeffrey Gearhart for his lecture today on sea turtles and so much more. Thank you.